Thanks, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to the next lecture in the public electric series attached to the Marie Curie Fine Art Program, uh, hosted uh, by the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, I just like to remind everybody that the the lecture is going to be recorded this evening, so please uh, bear that in mind. Anyway, it gives me um, a great um, pleasure. Uh, to introduce Mark James Leisure, who I have known for at least uh, 10 years. Over the last 10 uh, to 12 years, he's been an incredibly astute and uh, creative uh, theorist and uh, commentator on art, politics and culture under neoliberalism. I mean, you may know some of his books. Um, I'll list a few of them. The Neoliberal Undead Essays on Contemporary Art and Politics, Driving Cinema, Essays on Film, Theory and Politics, Don't Network the Avant-Garde After Networks, and Vanguardia, which is probably um, the book that has um, the greatest bearing on, on uh, the lecture that he's going to give this evening, Vanguardia, Socially Engaged uh, Art and Theory, that was published by Manchester University Press in 2018. Now, um, by way of a, of a critical introduction, I, I'd like to say a, a few things about Mark's writing, because um, the points I want to address here are the points I'm sure that will come up in some form in the lecture this evening. But also, uh, these are points that, um, that Mark deals with in great depth across these books I, I've mentioned and uh, in, other, in other books as well. And these are, firstly, the kind of cr the, the critique of uh, the network imperative as a critique of neoliberal systems of social and uh, well, social individuation and, and control under neoliberalism, uh, defense of the avant-garde and a critique of the critique of the idea of the vanguard. That's essentially uh, his argument in, in Vanguardia as a defense of uh, the vanguard as a um, uh, as axiomatic for some account of uh, socially engaged art, and finally a defense of universalism as against the politics of anti-essentialist difference. And these these three points are all, in a way, interwoven in these books, and I'm sure some of these points will come up um, for scrutiny and discussion in his lecture anyway. Thank you. So um, the floor is yours, Mark. Welcome. Thank you, John. Um, thanks for this invitation. And uh, thanks to everyone associated with fine arts, uh, Karen and Angela. I don't know if uh, Angela's here today, uh, but thanks to her as well. Um, and it's an honor for me to be included in this lecture series. It's also nice for me to get out of the house once in a while. So I appreciate um, this invite. Um, I made a uh, sort of music video to go along with uh, my presentation. So I'm just going to launch that now. And uh, let me know if... Okay, and uh, so I titled the, the original uh, presentation, I titled it um, C as PMC, um, but Karen mentioned to me that many of the students um, where she teaches aren't familiar with the concept of the PMC. Um, so I was a little bit surprised um, because in at least the uh, discussion around um, activists in the DSA um, and readers of Jacobin and Catalyst, uh, the term PMC is being used quite a, quite a lot uh, recently. But nevertheless, it, I, should, I shouldn't uh, presume familiarity with the concept. So I'll have a few things to say about it today. Um, but basically um, my purpose isn't to expound on the concept of the PMC. I'll, I'll introduce it briefly since I have um, many uh, points that I want to interlace in this presentation. So the title of uh, 
the, the talk I'm presenting, which is a, a short version of a paper, is the gray matter of decolonial activism, socially engaged art as professional managerial class. And it comes about as a response to a, a request to participate in this lecture series. Um, I haven't worked on contemporary socially engaged art in a few years. And the reason for that is I'll show in this next slide. Um, I've been working on, well, I mean, this is not unrelated to socially engaged art or to cultural theory generally, but um, in the last few years, I've written two books. I'm happy to say they're now um, accepted for publication. Uh, Bernie Bro's Gone Woke has been published by Brill. It's a critique of the um, Bernie 2020 campaign and the uh, pressures placed on candidates to lean into uh, demographics and market segmentation as a way to appeal to different kinds of voters for the sake of election victories. Um, and it came out of the work that I was doing on the other book, which will be out soon, uh, Too Black to Fail, The Obama Portraits and the Politics of Post-Representation, uh, which I started working on in 2018. It took a while for me to find a publisher for this title. I think it was a bit of a hot potato. It went from one desk to another, and I'm happy to say it will see the light of day in a few months. Um, the book is fairly extensive in its um, research interests in the sense that it's about both the, the, the Obama administration on a political level and the representation of in a way, this, uh, this, the legacy of Obama in the official portraits by Amy Sherald um, and Kehinde Wiley. And in this book, I uh, have a chapter that looks at different ways that the class and race um, discussion is presented uh, in different intellectual types or different intellectual stances that I've um, presented in categories, race brokers, race managers, race activists, um, post-race devil's advocates, as I refer to them. Uh, so the book is fairly extensive in terms of dealing with some of the issues I'll be talking about today around decoloniality. And also in the works is an edited text, Identity Trump Socialism, which has um, essays by the leading proponents of what I refer to as emancipatory universality. Um, so the point of this book is to help students, in particular um, graduate students, appreciate that there is such a thing as a left critique of identity politics. Uh, it seems a little bit ridiculous to make that assertion. Of course, we know this, but in some ways there's a lot of pressure on scholars to conform at this point to a kind of um, dualism, monarchyism, um, that in which you have the right on the one hand and you have the left, the, this kind of like amorphous left on the other as though it's a, a dual um, opposition, almost like a World War II popular front against fascism type of situation. So this book is making some distinctions with regard to what you could refer to as what I'll, I'll talk about later on. Um, so some buzzwords that are very popular at the moment that a lot of scholars feel compelled to deal with in, in one way or another in their work, often I would say in very tokenistic ways that are a little bit um, uh, dubious and questionable. And so it, it, I, I, I made it a bit of my responsibility to look into this and to, to have a um, response to some of the questions that have been asked at Fine Arts about decoloniality. Um, what's happening with decoloniality, with intersectionality as it relates to it, and with concepts like reparations and repatriation or rematriation, sometimes defined in relation to the um, Cedric Robinson concept of racial capitalism and settler epistemology. Um, what I won't get into in my presentation and what uh, most of you are somewhat familiar with, the background uh, theoretical debate and discussion around socially engaged art is all presumed and presupposed in what I have to say today. 
Um, so, you know, here it is, is this is sort of like the, the opening of my essay uh, in a nutshell. Um, and in relation to this material, uh, the, the presentation I'm giving today, I just want to mention Brave New Avant-Garde because um, the work that I'm doing now, as John mentioned in his introduction, is, is nothing new in a sense. I've been working on these ideas for some time. And um, in Brave New Avant-Garde, I wrote an essay called Welcome to the Cultural Goodwill Revolution, which references Pierre Bourdieu's cultural goodwill, uh, petty bourgeois habitus in distinction. And so um, what I did in Brave New Avant-Garde is I combined Peter Berger's historicized model of the development of the avant-garde. And I added a new layer, which you could think of as maybe the difference between modernism and postmodernism, where I argue that whereas Bourdieu sees the bourgeois habitus as being the dominant habitus, the bourgeois habitus still exists, but it's been displaced by the petty bourgeois habitus, which I argue is the dominant habitus. So that uh, reworks how we understand Bourdieu's um, three-partite uh, working class petty bourgeois and bourgeois habitus. And um, I see this at work uh, in what's happening today around identity politics in activism and in politics. Um, so the um, status of the work section there, you see market value and activism. So the, this, another way to think about this is what I've defined as the um, distinction within the petty bourgeoisie between an activist class and a creative class. Um, so I'll get back to this in a moment. And also in Drive and Cinema in the introduction, I, I titled the introduction one plus one plus A, which is a formula that um, I got from Zizek. And I think I have a quote from here, from him here. And um, I can't read this because this, the screen sharing. So the very element that blurs or displaces the purity of the class struggle also serves as its motivating force. So one plus one plus A is like the figure of the Jew in Nazi Germany. You have a conflict between labor and capital. This conflict cannot appear as such. And so it's displaced onto this external intruding element that arguably if you got rid of it, you would resume your organic totality. Um, we can use this to think about not only instances of racism, but we could use it to also think about how anti-racism anti is being deployed today in neoliberal ideology. So the tricky question is, what's the difference in that regard between uh, the neoliberal center and the left or new social movements? That's the sort of uh, tricky part of this uh, problem. Um, I, in my work, I don't think or work from the point of view of postmodernism. I consider myself Marxist in a fairly orthodox sense. Um, I consider myself, as John mentioned, also a defender of the avant-garde or uh, avant-gardist, not that I'm the avant-garde, but I defend the concept of vanguards and av the avant-garde. And I distinguish this from Postmodernism, uh, post structuralism, discourse theory, much of what is the lingua franca of academic work in, in the cultural sector and in the social sciences and humanities today. So, um, the broad sweep of how I see things is that, in terms of the, the becoming dominant of the petty bourgeois habitus, this has a lot to do with culture in the post war period, culture since the post war period, where many intellectuals and activists in a way broke, wanted to break away from uh, the state, wanted to break away from concepts associated with modernism. So from the, from the 40s through to the 70s, that was still a kind of, you know, that was kind of like um, almost a countercultural mode of um, functioning thinking with, which functioned within liberalism. So in other words, a lot of the second wave uh, gains that were made for social movements were within li political liberalism. They were part of what you could refer to as the democratic idea. And what we're seeing since the 80s with postmodernism is a rejection of that, a rejection of modernism, liberalism, political liberalism, the notion of human rights as a bourgeois construct, 
And so um, what it, my concern is then is with the, 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 the political implications of this petty bourgeois. Well, it's, it's almost as though we're, we're back at the um, fin de siècle the 19th century fin de siècle, but now rather than having the bourgeoisie in a moment of, of decadence, we have the petty bourgeoisie in its moment of decadence. And we're trying to break out of this um, cycle, this vicious cycle. Um, so that's the, the circumstances I see um, at play. Uh, for the invite to this presentation, I was asked to comment on um, Artist Organizations International, the possibility of different uh, socially engaged art groups to combine and to work together on goals. Um, but the work that I've been doing more recently is closer to the last chapter, which has to do with identity politics in this, in this new context. So I kind of put them together for this presentation and the prospect of, a, of, of a, um, an international, let's say of, socially engaged movements depends to some extent, I think on us thinking through and maybe resolving to some extent as much as possible, some of the questions around identity politics and intersectionality that are at play. Um, for the uh, exhibition I curated in Cyprus in 2018, we hosted class war games um, and they stage events around Guy Debord's Le Jeu de la Guerre. And they use this as a um, sort of like a framework or structure for thinking about different questions on the left regarding strategy and tactics. This particular event was um, framed as the two factions of the global petty bourgeoisie facing off, the activist uh, class and the creative class. So this was in 2018, and it gives you gives you a sense of how things have changed, at least as far as I understand them. So uh, for for socially engaged art as PMC, um, can someone read this? Because I can't see the 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 screen. the The images are blocking um, my text. Well, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll just ad lib. If in the early 2000s, radical social movement activists were generally opposed to the flex personalities of the creative class, these two factions of the global petty bourgeoisie have more recently compacted around questions of oppression and identity. So in other words, the, the, the creative class and the activist class have found something that they agree with. Um, and that would be identity politics or some version of identity politics. It could be, of course, a queer theoretical anti-identity type of interest in subjectivity or intersubjectivity and so on. Uh, but the point is, is that it's about new subjectivities. So the thesis of my presentation today is while there is no doubt that forms of dark matter exist and will continue to do so. Of course, this is with reference to Gregory Chollet's concept of dark matter, which I, I won't define for you here. Um, it's also possible that the post politics and post representational practices of socially engaged art are a declassed variant of the ideology of the post war professional managerial class. In other words, what presents itself as a post class type of thinking, a classless. Uh, politics or politics that's not uh, defined in terms of traditional left-right spectrum is actually a class politics. So what's the context of its emergence? Uh, these three terms I've borrowed from um, Nancy Fraser in an, an interesting essay on progressive neoliberalism, which is essentially the, the politics of um, people like uh, politicians like Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton, uh, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, uh, the tech sector, maybe the creative class, if you will, um, the, the extreme center. And we have, of course, rightist movements afoot, authoritarian neoliberalism and populism uses two different strategies. One, a neoliberalism very similar to the extreme center, but also with these neo-fascist or populist tendencies and 
opposed to both progressive populism of the Bernie Sanders or Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn type. So uh, whereas in actual fact, there's a um, an alignment between authoritarian neoliberalism and progressive neoliberalism, there's the idea that you could create a popular front against authoritarian neoliberalism by combining progressive populism with neo progressive neoliberalism. Um, so the point is to make some distinctions. And so we see this at play, for example, in the US with the 1619 project um, and with the attack on symbols of bourgeois enlightenment. In this case, uh, I have an image of a statue of Thomas Jefferson that was removed for racialist reasons from the New York State, New York City Hall. Um, so here you have the kinds of politics that you find on the one hand uh, in corporate neoliberal um, cultural politics, but also similar concepts are at play in the activist milieu. So what are, are, are they, are they shared or are they completely different? Um, and a quote from Steve Edwards in an essay he's, he published recently uh, in, the, in the journal Nonsight, to what extent do artists and cultural workers occupy the same structural position in the relations of production as the rest of a now declining middle class? Um, and I say that, or he says that, but I think that in relation to um, Barbara and John Ehrenreich's PMC uh, essay, which they revised over the years to more recently an essay called the, uh, I think it's the death of the yuppie dream, which they're talking about the, the decline of the PMC. Um, so from here, I have a uh, presentation that is read and I'm just wondering if you can give me a sense of how much time I should dedicate or to this and how much time I have. Well, you um, roughly, uh, we have until seven or just after seven, a little bit more. So it's up to you how, uh, how much you wanna spend on this. We wanna have some time later on for Q and A as well. Okay, well, um, I, I tested myself with this once. So um, it, it's anywhere between 30 minutes and 40 minutes. Um, if, it, if it drags on, just let me know. I, I can cut it short and uh, synthesize. But I think that it's worth, it's worth um, uh, me presenting this because to make this kind of criticism, wh what, <laughs> uh, Weiwei, what do you say? Is it too long? No, okay. To make this kind of criticism gets could could get you in hot water, right? Uh, if I'm criticizing activists who are working with decolonial concepts, um, these are these are like hot topics in a sense and important topics and deserve uh, uh, to be thought about critically. And so I just want to make sure that um, what I'm saying is understood and not simply thought of as provocation because that's not my point. My point is to ask the question, um, how are these new directions um, helping the people they claim to help and how do they advance the cause of the left more generally? So those are my, my concerns. So um, in the analysis of social classes, Eric Olin Wright disputed the idea that class is disappearing and argued instead that its explanatory power remains central to the Marxist project of historical materialism. The problem of complexity in actual class relations, he argued, brings the question of class location, by this he means uh, middle class, for example, to the forefront of the problem involved in organizing class conscious political formations. Whereas Marx believed that the middle class was a non-class doomed to extinction, liberalism views the middle class as its social base and ideological lodestar. That the broad middle class now avoids radicalism has been a preoccupation of sociologists since the post-war period. In the late 1970s, in the context of the retreat of the labor movement, Barbara and John Ehrenreich updated the Marxist critique of the petty bourgeoisie with their concept of the professional managerial class. In the US, they argued, the non-revolutionary left identifies with the middle class, 
Although the PMC expresses solidarity with working people, it exists in an, in an quote, objectively antagonistic relationship to the working class, unquote, representing approximately 20% of the workforce and some 50 million American workers. The class function of the PMC is the reform of capitalism in the interest of the PMC's relative class power, which is based in intellectual, professional, and managerial occupations. Anxiety about social reproduction makes the petty bourgeois PMC's constant revision of social mores and lifestyles one of its main preoccupations, a, phenom best, a phenomenon best described by Pierre Bourdieu in his classic study of social distinction. Replacing professional competence with moral critique, the post-war PMC became the arbiter of social change, substituting the standard concerns of the working class with countercultural and new social movement issues. Both the success and rejection of 60s radicalism in the 1970s resulted in the politicization of all professional sectors, reducing autonomy and making even radicalism more conducive to market directives. Abandoning the language of class, the PMC helped to create the, con the conditions that contributed to its own decline. The neoliberal attack on the professions, on welfare, unions, labor regulations, consumer protections, and environmental standards facilitated the technological revolution and the rise of global trade regimes that fueled the hegemony of a new gilded age of billionaire wealth. Theorizing about the PMC has increased on the social democratic left alongside critiques of culture wars and corporate woke washing. Some of this discussion has been spurred by confusion about the significance of the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and the effort shown by the liberal class to blame racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia on the working class, usually defined as the white working class. The myth of a bigoted white working class is structurally necessary to the dominance of the neoliberal establishment and the corporate media. It also serves the PMC in the academy where callouts and cancellations, diversity mandates and sensitivity training have become new means to demand more from employees while employers offer them less in return. In the absence of workplace democracy, vague social justice critiques of whiteness, patriarchy and settler colonialism replace the quote modernism of solidarity and autonomy with the quote postmodernism of masochism and allyship. And here I'm thinking of um, Simon Critchley's book, Infinitely Demanding. The quote privileged are now expected to sacrifice something so that socially ascribed others, typically middle class or tokenistically working class, can be centered and empowered. That today's PMC culture wars are profoundly antisocial, mixing political relativism with the zero sum game of empowerment makes the notion of color vision, as opposed to color blindness, paradoxical. Whites are called upon to own up to their hidden racism in coercive training sessions that explain to them how they must sacrifice themselves in order to atone for the sins of their ancestors. Likewise, minority subjects are expected to perform their role as the victims of history or as righteous avengers. Criticism of the PMC is often rejected as a class reductionist or class essentialist form of vulgar Marxism. The charge of class reductionism, however, should not be used against leftists who are concerned to demonstrate the PMC character of those who are conspicuously woke in today's neoliberalized academy and NGO sector. Having come under the control of the educated middle class, the political culture of the left identified PMC promotes the kind of activism that facilitates institutional networking, provides through private sector fundraising and volunteer labor, essential services that the state no longer oversees. It reinforces foreign policy and bureaucratizes social problems in the interest of community leaders and technocrats. Promoting alliances across, across classes rather than within the working class 
the NGO art of the activist PMC has the unintended consequence of reinforcing the status quo. Aware of these contradictions, the professional artists and activists who have organized around today's decolonial initiatives have made the rhetoric of socially ameliorative art all the more implacable by making th their mandate the redress of nothing less than the last 500 years of settler colonialism. So this is a uh, graphic that was circulated at the time of Occupy Wall Street, which is looking at the problem of wealth inequality and presented this in terms of uh, geographic ownership of the territory of the US. And this has become a, um, a, a, a sort of uh, graphic that decolonial activists use to, to say what's wrong with Occupy. So postmodern discourse theory alters the sense of history to remake politics into a genealogical project that takes contemporary differences as the starting point for everything that constitutes knowledge. In the feverish return of postmodern anti-modernism after Occupy, the micropolitics of difference have been given pragmatic and institutional leverage, first as part of a neo neoliberal project to advance diversity mandates, and second, as part of an academic intersectionality that relativizes class as one form of oppression among others. An example of this would be the work of Bell Hooks. The latest trend to advance a postmodern critique of everything is decoloniality. Among indigenous activists, decoloniality has two main objectives, land back and the abolition of the museum. Land back refers not only to broken treaties and the occupation of unceded territories, but calls for the return of all indigenous land to its original inhabitants. Indigenous knowledge rejects the anthropocentric fiction of borders and the notion that land can be owned. The indigenous are said to wish to return to traditional governing systems, ways of relating to the land, languages, and medicines. On this issue, settlers are welcome to help land defenders and their opposition to extractive industries. However, academic settlers are criticized for being overzealous in their red washing, land acknowledgement virtue signaling, and guilt reducing information extraction. A key text in, this, in the literature of decoloniality is Tuck and Yang's essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. These authors distinguish decolonization from human rights discourse, citizenship, civil rights, third worldism, Frarian pedagogy, Western feminism, post-colonial theory, and social justice activism. Rejecting easy paths to reconciliation means attending to what is irreconcilable in intersectional methods of research. So decoloniality is uh, part of intersectionality, but also a challenge to intersectionality. Although Tuck and Yang define descendants of settlers as trespassers, they nevertheless call on everyone to expose colonial structures. However, saviors, missionaries, parachuters, gatekeepers, floaters, action junkies, tourists, and provocateurs are just so many types that decolonial activists reject in favor of accomplices who collaborate to unsettle colonialism. Since these authors accept terms borrowed from discourse theory, it comes as no surprise that they reject the idea that colonialism has any specific relation to capitalism. Tuck and Yang argue that socialism and communism are no less guilty of settler ways, even if socialists seek to exploit resources for the benefit of everyone. Occupy is criticized as simply, quote, another settler reoccupation of stolen land. The 99% are 99% settler. These authors reject wealth redistribution since land back would leave settlers with no wealth to redistribute. And they make the point that much wealth is actually invested in land. That advocates of land back make no distinction between class factions among indigenous groups underscores the PMC character of its racialist politics. Um, I could 
or we could go on at length about different uh, decolonial activist actions that have taken place in the last few years. Um, I'll simply mention that making use of critical race theory, artists affiliated with the group Decolonize This Place have called for the creation of a decolonization commission to undo whiteness at the Whitney Museum. So this extends the land back discussion to uh, the critique of museums among decolonial scholars. Um, and these um, uh, actions around and against museums take place in the context of other kinds of activisms in, for example, defense of Palestinian rights or against uh, pipeline construction on indigenous land with for example, the rebellion at Standing Rock and the protests of the Wet'suwet'en against the coastal gas link pipeline. Um, these posters show um, the American Museum of Natural History, in particular, the statue of Theodore Roosevelt that decolonized this museum would like to have removed. I don't think it's been removed yet. Um, strike MoMA. As the Occupy artists who first targeted the financial sector refocused their efforts on the art world, many of the activists associated with Decolonize This Place organized 10 weeks of events in April and June of 2021 called Strike MoMA. Headed by the Strike MoMA Working Group, Strike MoMA called for the abolition of the Museum of Modern Art by accelerating the collective exit of its, from its terms and conditions. Linking the critique of the museum with the millions who demonstrated in the George Floyd uprising of 2020 allows a fairly small number of activists to combine principles of divestment with the shock and awe of moral exhortation against, for example, precarity, inequality, elitism, venture capitalism, mass incarceration, anti-blackness and misogyny. According to Decolonize This Place, MoMA is a front line of gendered and racialized class war. Strike MoMA's days of action included training sessions, writing projects, agitprop campaigns, performances, direct actions at the museum, virtual and in-person conversations, assemblies, open letters, and walking tours. One issue that made Strike MoMA different from most academic intersectionality was its critique of the corporate diversity agenda and the quote ally industrial complex that advances the careers of individual scholars on the basis of the efforts of those who sacrifice themselves for struggle. Does some of this criticism of individual scholars not also apply to activist collectives, we could ask? That these activists associate quote unquote normative culture with toxic masculinity and white ableism makes collective liberation more extortionist than solidaristic. Most people reject the use of violence against anyone, whether they are black, colonized, indigenous or not. That there are disparities between social groups does not by itself determine the best ways to mitigate those problems. And what about culture? One of the leading intellectuals of this consort, Andrew Ross, who's an occasional member of MTL, reduces modern art to the quote, corporate aesthetic of the American century. All of modern art, we are told, is little more than colonial white supremacy. And um, for the remainder, I, I have uh, graphics on um, labor activity and economic inequality. And these are meant to um, illustrate the 50 year counter revolution. Strike MoMA's politics of institutional liberation of the art system is said to go beyond the presentation of political subject matter in the art of high profile artists, including those artists who pioneered the investigation of the political and ideological connections between museums and the broader society. So we can think of, for example, Hans Hacke, Guerrilla Girls, though they're not identified, Fred Wilson, Andrea Fraser, for example. 
Today's infrastructural turn towards decoloniality and reparations makes particularity rather than art commodities into the fetish of activists who insist on a struggle that has no known precedents, no goals in particular, and no program, but that nevertheless demand a creative questioning of power that asks whites to sacrifice themselves to an obscure, quote, sharing of colonial wounds. By hypostatizing the default patriarchy and white supremacy of the institution art, to use Peter Berger's phrase, this now anti-reformist intersectional activism has made itself into the bad conscience of neoliberal governance, as opposed to the good conscience of neoliberal governance that we were seeing earlier with NGO art. Despite, these, the, despite the activists' correct identification of serious social problems, their decentering of constitutional rights and institutional authority, I argue, accelerates the work begun by neoconservative forces in the 1980s. I'm referring to the attack on the professions. From a socialist perspective, the importance given to discourse theory and discursive historicism on today's academic left is a political and tactical mistake. Dissolving class analysis into a mix of single issue planks, the quote, constituent, instituent, and now destituent practices of the autonomous left are defined by one overblown concept after another. Having now abandoned Western, uh, quote unquote, rationalist, modernist, and anthropocentric critical theory, along with the world of museums, galleries, and biennales, the activist game of one-upping the Marxist left through hystericized appeals to anti-oppression tends to ignore much of what we could learn from the failures of the civil rights struggles of the 60s, not so much their successes, but their failures, as they careened towards black capitalism, lean-in feminism, and CIA intersectionality. The noted critic of American race politics, Adolf Reed, argues that the tension within left politics is not between those who take a class or an identity-based perspective, but rather that the identity-oriented perspective is a PMC class politics that is antagonistic to the left. Among the several problems that he identifies in contemporary anti-racism is the reinforcement of race essentialism. And so we could find different definitions of race essentialism in, for example, the work of Toure Reed in his work on race reductionism, in the work of Barbara and Karen Fields in their work on racecraft. We can find it in Trotsky's critique of fascism and his concept of zoological materialism, and also in Badiou in his critique of democratic materialism. Race reductionism leads to an obsession with red herrings like epistemological whiteness, which inflate morality over politics and weaken class solidarity. So anyone who's familiar with the kind of argument that I'm making, th this is basically the baseline. You'll hear this over and over again, that you replace politics with morality and you weaken class solidarity. Um, but there's much more to say in theoretical philosophical terms in terms of the study of history and so on. The reduction of left politics to the redress of grievances, as is the case with reparations and land back, accompanies the attack on the organized left in favor of liberal and liberationist orientations. Though, of course, of course those uh, Foucauldian um, politics wouldn't use the word liberationist. Um, so in this graph, you see, um, union membership declining and the, the, the control of wealth by the 10% increasing. If we added the 1% uh, to this graph, you'd see a much, a much higher line. One interesting factor though, is that in Europe, it's not quite as bad as it is in the US. So that's an interesting uh, point and largely has to do with the greater amount of unionization in Europe, European countries. So one of the problems that post-Occupy artists must now contend with is the question of constituency. Artists are typically unconcerned with the question of political representation, uh, the German term Vertretung, uh, 
is what I mean by this, as opposed to Dars Talong. Dars Talong being symbolic representation and Virtutong being political representation. Artists are not normally concerned with that, especially artists who disengage from anything that has to do with state power. In anarchist circles, autonomy, meetings, convergences, and direct action are the standard modus operandi. The lack of a mass constituency for decolonial politics allows activists to replace a comprehensive policy orientation with sub-sectarian affinity groups. While the anarchist left has at times been suspicious of the capitalist capture of subjectivity through identity politics, it has more recently been swayed by, by, sorry, by diversitarians to abandon its more strident principles when it comes to class and identity. And I point out um, two articles by Hart and Negri that illustrate what I'm saying. One published in New Left Review called, I think, something like 20 years after Empire. And another in a uh, reader that was edited by um, Christian uh, Fuchs on the 200 year anniversary of Marx. Uh, I think there may be another co-editor, I don't remember. Um, anarchist activism nowadays receives more support from the institutionalized PMC in the universities and museums than was previously the case when Marxism was still rigorously debated, let's say from the 60s through to the 80s. The overtly anti-communist character of today's activism makes, makes its radicalism congenial to the requirements of neoliberal academia, the media and the creative industries. And this is not only something that affects um, anarchists, this is something that affects every leftist who wanted a serious university post uh, since the post-war period. As neoliberalism goes unchecked, the reactionary right steps in to falsely pose as a radical alternative to the rot in the system of disaster capitalism. The far right heightens the identity conflict that conflicts that weaken the class solidarity that is essential to socialist internationalism, leaving the job of solving these conflicts to the same PMC that inflames them. Distorting the history of past efforts to transcend differences and build class solidarities, contemporary anti-oppression politics promote means-tested concepts like reparations at the expense of universal means to improve the living conditions of the masses worldwide. The racialist initiatives that are popular with upper stratum elites are supported by the PMC because they're ultimately oriented towards the reduction of the racial and gender wealth gap, not the reduction of class inequality. Non-Black, non-Indigenous, and non-female working people are relegated to allied duty as bearers of trans-historical racism and male privilege. That the culture war is now also fought by neoliberal governments and the corporate media weakens the left and moves politics further to the right. How can new social movements reckon with 500 years of history when they can hardly prevent the advance of the far right under figures like Le Pen, Johnson, and Trump? The solution that seems to satisfy all parties is the removal of offensive symbols and the institutional promotion of race representatives. This service is now being provided by activist artists whose efforts to occupy Wall Street have been roundly defeated and we have statistics on the growth of wealth inequality during uh, COVID. We see how um, the war in Ukraine is being used as a pretext to drive up prices, uh, creating falsely creating inflation. The contemporary obsession with diversity ignores the fact that labor extraction is the dominant mode of surplus generation. Workers today, this is more the case today than it was in Marx's time. Workers are today atomized by the global labor market and desolidarized by postmodern anti-communism. As Fong and Naschek argue, changes to the social and class composition of the left have also changed its political orientation, shifting as Jane McAlevey has it from leftist organization to social movement mobilization. The dominance of 
The international networks of corporate capitalism is the result of decades of anti-democratic labor laws and trade treaties that have created pools of cheap labor to serve the needs of markets. The decline of the labor left is not due to toxic masculinity or white privilege, but rather to the combined process of global integration of economic development and intensification of labor exploitation. I'll get to performance art a little bit later once I'm finished this section. As the developed nations experience a decline in the global share of labor with lower, lower wages and greater employment insecurity, the petty bourgeois PMC in the now neoliberalized knowledge and culture industries are actively pitting identity groups against one another. Rather than engage in woke wars, activists should dedicate themselves to the necessary work of rebuilding an emancipatory, universalist, and socialist alternative. Activist artists should take up the challenge of enhancing the social and cultural prestige of the left and help to facilitate the struggles of the organizations of the working masses. Against the intentions of the participants themselves, what PMC boutique activism accomplishes is the reemergence of populism and fascism. That the post-political left now shares with traditional fascism some of the same anti-enlightenment, anti-universality, and anti-revolutionary values is cause for serious self-scrutiny. That is, rather than indulgence in protest narcissism. If identity politics and postmodern theory shoulders some of the blame for this shift to the right, then activist academia should show more responsibility to the rest of society than it currently does. To what extent then does decolonial activism actually advance the cause of the people it claims to represent? Or better still, does decolonial activism advance the politics of the left? To answer this question, the ed editors of the journal October fielded a questionnaire among participants in the discussion around decoloniality, revealing, if nothing else, divergent viewpoints. Among those contending parties, critics of decoloniality mentioned the following. And I'm almost finished. The vast heterogeneity of indigenous groups and their active participation for good and bad in the developments of the last 500 years. The unlikelihood of regaining lost territories and restoring pre-contact ways of life, which isn't all, obviously always the case because a lot of indigenous activism is um, framed in a way that's similar to Afrofuturism. So you have a kind of indigenous futurism that's actually at work. Um, the implausibility of replacing modernization with indigenous cosmology, the problem that decoloniality can be applied to anything while at the same time evacuating local meanings. And I like this little nugget that was in the questionnaire. For example, the fact that the Inuit believe that, is, that it is impolite to tell others what to think. The superficiality, immaturity, and opportunism of decoloniality as moral discourse. The self-defeating nature of separatist attempts to replace universality with particularism. The continuity rather than break of decolonization with previous forms of anti-colonial struggle. The fluid rather than inherently racist category of aesthetics. The nebulousness of decolonial demands and the violence involved in trying to shock people into joining an easily co-opted academic movement. The problem of simply replacing one corrupt board member with another or one hashtag cause with another. The affinity of indigenous struggles with the anti-capitalist left. So while it is right to pressure institutions to sever ties with the fossil fuel industry or with trustees who have investments in private prisons and detention centers and so on, it is absurd to blackmail working people with the rhetoric of self-sacrifice, which actually in terms of uh, the history of uh, 20th century politics, sacrifice is more often associated with the fascist right than the left, which emphasizes solidarity and struggle. 
Capitalism has already collectivized individual labors. The point is to know it. If we're determined to tackle climate change, economic inequality, and militarism, one of our tasks must be the analysis and critique of academic efforts to break the material and intellectual basis of the socialist movement and to prevent the emergence of a labor-oriented left. Concepts that claim to offer new epistemologies of incommensurability function to stabilize the interests of the academic PMC and its activist NGO sector. Not surprisingly, it is those who say that art and politics lack all criteria and principles who also seek to steer the connectivity that is managed through post-institutional platforms. We could call this whatever immanentism or um, quoting Deleuze, becoming Elon Musk. Contemporary disagreements over means-tested social policy, diversity training, cancel culture, and acts of iconoclasm are only some of the consequences of the social tensions that are managed by the latest middle-class formations. And um, one of the more uh, interesting um, readings that I came across in preparing this presentation is a text by uh, Richard Barbrook called, I forget what it's called, The Class of the New. And um, it looks at this idea of the PMC, the middle class or the new, middle, the new, uh, the new class. And he traces it um, across the last 200 years, roughly, and has come up with some 30 different versions of this concept of the PMC. So it's not a new concept. It's one that's been around for a while. And the assumption is that the activity of this new class especially as it relates to mode of production and technology is what leads social change. Um, so I'll stop it here and um, I'll, I'll just put these up on the board very quickly. Um, I don't want to name drop, um, but um, just so that students know where I'm coming from in terms of some of these ideas, uh, on class and identity, some of the key figures for me would be um, Rossier, Ellen Mikesons Wood, Alain Badiou, Slavoj Žižek, Adolf Reed, Walter Ben Michaels, and Mark Fisher. Um, and there are others. So, um, what happened? What do we do on the left with the fact that discourse theory and discursive historicism have become, in some ways, the lingua franca of academia and even in terms of something that I don't even know what it means, deep structures. Um, Post-structuralism shapes the way we think in ways I think, in ways I would say that we're not actually uh, aware of. Um, so I, what, one of the things that I, I want to do is deprogram um, the way I'm thinking. That might mean replacing discourse theory with uh, Hegelian Marxism or some other method or philosophy. And you know that's, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but I'm not satisfied with post-structuralist arguments against Marxism. So I'll take that out. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, We've got um, well at least half an hour for questions. So if anybody wants to present um, their questions or um, uh, points to to Mark, um, you can either speak or you can put your question in in, in the chat. Um, Andreas. Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for the talk. Like a lot of. Uh, great references and, and great uh, resources to think about. Um, I was just wondering about, um, I mean, you, in the beginning, you, you put up all these books, which kind of, um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, you, 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 wow. Sorry, I turned off my mute. Okay. Uh, you, you, um, you had all these these books, which were kind of like the, your background, the background of your definition of socially engaged art. But still, I, I would like to kind of know a little bit more, like kind of how how you see this this kind of particular field of 
of artistic practice, because now you were mostly referring to kind of what you could call identitarian um, socially engaged art. And would you say this is in some ways synonymous in your analysis or, or are there also other forms of, of what you can still call socially engaged art, which are still, which are kind of leaning more towards socialist um, practice? Like I'm just, just kind of uh, because, um, yeah, just as a question, like how, how you see this term. Uh, thanks, Andreas, for your question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that, uh, if, if you look at the books that I showed very quickly, um, there's obviously a development, right? Uh, the, the books that come later are often interacting with the uh, previous uh, publications as social art and theory. Um, so, scholars are, are engaged with other scholars in a similar way that movements are interacting and um, in some ways advancing their practice. So I've, I've been following this since my you know, early days of art history, right? Where at that time we were talking about public art. We weren't talking about the word socially engaged art. I don't think, I don't know who coined it, but it didn't exist at the time. Um, so we were talking about public art and there's a, 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 like before the 80s, there's a prehistory of community art, right? Artists who are engaged with communities in various ways, doing different kinds of, of work. And the mural movement or the history of, let's say, uh, New Deal murals, for example, there's different kinds of different ways of thinking about public art. Some of it has to do with uh, trying to not have a hermetic art world, art discussion, like this modernist I mean, of course, the avant-garde were never concerned with like making it into the MoMA, right? But um, our history retroactively constructs these things as a kind of teleology. Um, and of course, you know, as you know, Marxist influence by Walter Benjamin, we want to burst the continuum of history, right? We want to look at what people's um, hopes were in terms of um, getting out of what, uh, what Benjamin talks about as um, this kind of like uh, uh, history without history, you know, this kind of end of history, end of ideology kind of capitalist universe. So uh, the question of change and progress is essential. And so our artists who are involved in social practice are thinking about, well, does this work? You know, how is this going to be received? Is it effective? Like, um, uh, Vodichko once said, the uh, projection artist Christoph Vodichko, <clears throat> he once said that once his projections no longer function, he'll turn them against himself. You know, once, once these gestures have been received and in some ways become reified, um, you have to try something else and move on. So the socially engaged art is doing this. One of the, um, one of the points that I began with is the statement made by Yates, McKee, who's involved, I'm pretty sure he's a member or was a member of um, MTL Plus, and is also in Decolonize This Place. And uh, he wrote a very good book on uh, Occupy Art Practices or Post-Occupy Art Practices, Social Movement Art. And the statement he made that you have in the invitation to this presentation is that um, at one point, people who were involved in um, art activism left the Creative Time Summit, um, you, you know, which is uh, Nato Thompson organized, well, he, while he was the director of Creative Time, organized these wonderful conferences that brought, like Artist Organizations International, a lot of socially engaged artists into the same space to present their work. Um, they left the uh, Creative Time Summit at the time of Occupy Wall Street and join the, the crowd, join the people at Occupy. And so he says that's a moment of self-awareness for socially engaged movement artists. And that at that time, it was, it was the point to recognize that um, socially engaged art had become a kind of, I mean, I said this in uh, Brave New Avant-Garde that in some ways, despite its radicalism, uh, socially engaged art was a kind of official art. It was supported by institutions uh, and museums early on, 
And so you, you find this um, problem that avant-garde artists have, which is being kind of co-opted in advance because the system is capable of accepting critique. In fact, the point that uh, Bavo make in their essay on over-identification is that the system wants critique. The system wants to be uh, renovated in that way. And so, you know, you have someone like um, Manfredo Tafuri, who a long time ago said that art is the research and development arm of whatever global capitalism. Um, so the, the point of practices after Occupy, and we see this with strike art. If you look at strike art and decolonize this place and Gulf Labor Coalition and GULF, um, they're affiliated with a whole network of social movement groups. Some of them are art-based, some of them are not. Um, and I think in some ways what's happened is that um, with strike art, I mean, it's, it's contradictory to say the least, but is to make claims that are so um, over, that they're so broad that uh, it's not, it's no longer the question of working with the community to identify a specific problem like Wachenklauser used to do, uh, but that, you know, you're, you're trying to, in a way, uh, prefigure a different world altogether, like a complete system change. And so what happens is that the, the, the critique, the number of issues that are, that are sort of compacted, all of, them, all of them worthwhile in various ways and legitimate in various ways, but in an activist um, setting that is in a way kind of functioning oddly in, in ways that are very similar to what we see happening elsewhere in our culture, which has to do with, has to do with Twitter, it has to do with cancel culture. It has to do with call outs. It has to do with this kind of like uh, shaming culture or acts of humiliation, right? That of course the activists like MTL or Decolonize This Place or Gulf Labor, in a way they're, they're, they're too professional, right? They're too sophisticated to, to play those games. And so they're offering something much more, um, something more comprehensive, maybe structurally, uh, different. So um, the Strike MoMA reader that was put out by the working group of, uh, it's, it has a long IIAAF, the IIAAF. Um, they didn't put it out as a publication, I don't think, but it is available online. And you have 350 pages and most of short texts, very short texts, very interesting. Um, and all of these short texts are slightly different depending on where the person's coming from and what their main concern is as a social movement group. It could be uh, Palestine, it could be um, racial capitalism, for example. Um, but they, they'll start off with, well, they'll say a lot of the same things, um, often with a land claim acknowledgement at the beginning and then repeating some of the, uh, some of the points that Strike Malma wanted everyone to know. Now, in a protest situation, of course, you get this kind of cohesion, right? You get a kind of um, crowd uh, march, you get a chant, you get people doing the same thing, the same, the same gestures, and it creates cohesion. In a book, it's kind of odd to, to, to have that, right? Because usually you'll have essays and one person will say one thing to, based on their competence, someone else will say something else, and you don't want too much repetition. But the Strike MoMA reader is interesting for its repetition, right? But at the same time, it has this sort of like, I'm almost in my Frankfurt school uh, ways uh, suspicious of it, right? Because it seems a little bit incantatory. It seems a little bit um, over the top. And I think that's, I mean, it's imaginative, right? That's why the, it's, that they, they, it's referred to as a kind of imagination project. So it's, it's not you know, pragmatic exactly. Uh, it's, it's trying to sort of open people's imaginations and even something like something like a, a, a Michael Hart idea of the heart, right? You're trying to open the heart to uh, a politics of sharing and caring and giving. Um, and it has, I mean, those, those things are fine. Th those things are, you know, Michael Hart was talking a lot about love in the last few years. Uh, Badiou had a discourse of love that was completely different. Like for Badiou, love is between two people. 
You know, it's not, love isn't something, I wouldn't want to have to love everyone, right? If I had to, if I walk down the street, I, I don't want to give love to every person I meet and I don't want them to give me love, right? I don't want them to give me hate or, or aggression or abuse or anything like that. But th these, are, these are forms of moral exhortation that, um, you know, to put it in the language of Adolf Fried, that when it comes to practical issues that have to do with, you know, housing, healthcare, um, demilitarization, ecological, uh, ecological change, they don't necessarily define, you know, a program, a set of policies, an orientation that would allow people to make those things effective. The assumption is that people don't care about these things. And I think, I think that's false. Um, everything in our government at the moment, in neoliberal governance, there was a good article about this by David Sirota on Jacobin. About neo, neo governance wants to convince us that governments are not there for us. I, I refer to this in the Obama book as post-representation. So governments no longer represent you. You can elect them, but they're not there for you. They're, they're there for donors, they're there for the market. Um, and they, they, they will go out of their way to, to you know, make you as pessimistic as possible. Um, so <clears throat> my argument is that the left, the, the, um, the new social movement horizontalist left in some ways does the same thing. In some ways, it's telling you that, you know, th these measures that like the eight hour workday, it's not the kind of thing that we can have anymore, right? So instead of an eight hour workday, we could be going to a four day work week. We could be going to UBI. That would free up time. That would, you know, give people more, more uh, time to uh, inform themselves about what's happening in politics. Of course, they could use their time to do whatever they need to do. Some, it could be simply rest, right? But these kinds of things can be achieved. Um, they're not a panacea, these sort of things. They're, they're, they're not necessarily even an alternative to capitalism. Um, but the, the activist milieu has in some ways satisfied itself with performativity. And it's satisfied itself with performativity because it's obsessed with this notion of norms. It's obsessed that knowledge is normative and that normative knowledge is somehow uh, bad, corrosive, uh, and so on. And so the, the only modality that you're allowed in a postmodern uh, world is a deconstructive modality where you're taking things apart and reorganizing them. Um, and it lends you to a kind of uh, resistance model of politics rather than an organization model of politics that comes from the 60s it comes from the rejection of totalitarianism, the, 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 the idea that any kind of organized politics, once it becomes a mass politics, will almost inevitably be corrupted and work against you. Um, so, you know, those are sort of the, the large outlines that I'm working within uh, and thinking about in terms of a critique of, um, of social practice. And so in terms of an artist organization international, what, what I think would be interesting is that in, if artists were activist artists, instead of tearing down statues, if they were working with organized labor, helping workers organize and unionize, would, wouldn't that be exciting at this moment? Wouldn't that be interesting at this moment? Because there you'd have, I mean, the DSA has 95,000 members at this point. You know, I, I just checked. Um, I don't agree with everything uh, that's said in the DSA, um, but that's, that's a significant number up from 5,000 five, uh, five or 10 years ago. Um, and it expresses in, in real terms, the people's disengagement from the kind of politics that we have in an official, you know, at the official level. I just don't think that um, the left can stay this can remain this agonistic left, you know? And I don't think it's pure, right? Like some people Mark, say this, yeah. Mark, um, we have some more questions and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite um, Karen to, to ask another question or to ask a question so we can move on. Uh, Karen, would you, would you like to? Yes, uh, go the conversation? 
Yeah, it goes in the same direction as uh, Andrea's uh, question, because um, uh, yeah, th thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. And um, uh, I really like the way how you um, lay out all the ambivalencies and uh, the dialectic role of the art in that. But um, nevertheless, I have a question um, how you um, would conceptualize maybe the relation between what you call the leftist organization and um, the movers, as you call it. Um, so I, I don't understand uh, exactly how, how you think of the role and uh, of art and um, of to, especially of avant-garde art. So um, how do you see that um, given that um, you, you addressed to art as uh, the research and development arm of capitalism and you quoted um, Andrew Ross uh, that modern art can be seen as a colonial white supremacy um, thing. Uh, so how would you suggest um, the, the, or how would you define the ideal role of art in that? And how does um, the, how, how do the movements relate to what you call organ, leftist organizations? Yeah. Um, by the way, I, um, with regard to Manfredo Tafuri, I don't necessarily agree with him. I, I was just mentioning that as a kind of, uh, you know, like one, one take on this idea. Um, one of the things that interests me in, in being able to answer this question has to do with like from a, how do we think about what's happening in contemporary art? And that includes uh, social practice art, but it's not limited to social practice art, but how to think of it in class terms. Is there a class analysis um, of um, socially engaged art? And it tends to be, you know, by and large, it tends, it tends to be avoided, right? It tends to be evacuated in contemporary art. Marxism is something you learn in um, first and second year uh, undergraduate school. And then when you get to graduate school, it's kind of like uh, the minotaur in the labyrinth, you know, you don't want to get too close to it, right? It's like it's, it's, it's there and it should be in, informing your work, but you don't want to be speaking from that place. Because if you do, then, you know, you're sectarian. So, you know, someone as um, important to us as Zizek, for example, will always say, you know, I'm not crazy. You know, <laughs> I'm not thinking like a modernist uh, in these terms, right? Like 20th century communism. Um, and so that's in a way that's in a way it's, it has to do with how we, we the situation, the contingencies in which these things can be conceived. Of course, I'm not concerned strictly speaking with conditions of possibility, right? That would be, that would be lame. Um, but um, I had a thought, um, but I don't remember what it was, but what you're asking me about is the difference between organization and mobilization, right? That was brought up by Jane McAlevey. And so I suggested that artists, for example, could be um, rather than, I mean, one of the things that happens is that every now and then you're um, interpolated by a different uh, single issue cause. Sometimes they come and go and sometimes they stick around. So for example, uh, Black Lives Matter has had a certain, um, uh, you know, uh, presence over time. Me Too has stayed over time. I mean, not always for the good, right? Some of it is maybe for the good. Some of it we've seen is also for the bad, uh, but it has a, it, it's kind of stayed over time. So that's, that, that's an interesting phenomenon since it's very different from something like second wave feminism, right? Which was oriented a little bit more towards um, political liberalism. Um, so it's interesting that these, you know, these, they're not really like social movements per se because they're adaptable to different contexts. Uh, but basically it's like saying, you know, anti-patriarchy and anti-oppression and gender issues and why it has to have me too as a hashtag uh, 
I mean, I don't know, it, it doesn't necessarily, but it's, it's a way of like refreshing, right? It's a way of reviving some of these concerns that people feel have uh, dissipated. So I was um, very excited by, in the, in the 2000s, you know, what people refer to as the return, let's say, of history, or the return of modernist concepts of left and right politics. Um, and after Occupy, what you had was a sort of like, you know, rushing in of, of postmodern uh, approaches, almost as though academia was worried we were losing, we were losing uh, our postmodernism, like we're like postmodernism is losing the, uh, the, the academic argument. And the way that the way that it was finessed, you could say, was through identity. Like identity was the way that you could bring back Foucault, you could bring back discourse theory, you could bring back Lyotard and Baudrillard uh, and what have you. And I think that, you know, the, the, the Joshua Clover take on the difference between Black Lives Matter and the there's different people have talked about in days, but it was suggested that there was a bifurcation after uh, Occupy that some of the social move or some of the left went in this Black Lives Matter direction. Some of the left went into this more organization um, direction, in particular around the Sanders campaigns and around Corbyn and around the DSA. Um, and so, you know, that's like, like that distinction that you point to exists in practical terms in the society, right? Um, social, socially engaged art tends to function more on the social movement left. It tends to be more effective in that way because it agrees more with its intellectual um, uh, concepts and it's not interested in the state. So, you know, some people that I know I, who, who I sent the, um, the announcement for Bernie Bros Gone Woke, uh, colleagues that were people, I mean, like I said, these are not things I wasn't saying in my previous work, but all of a sudden I send uh, an announcement for Bernie Bros Gone Woke and it's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is like weird state oriented left right thinking. Um, and this is, you know, this is unacceptable, you know, uh, hang the phone. And, uh, and I believe the reason, the reason for it, it's, I mean, the, the left, the differences among tendencies on the left have been there for a long time. They're not particularly new, but I think the uh, identity aspect to these issues is the kind of the splinter in a way. It's sort of like uh, it's sort of like the way abortion functions as a splinter issue in U.S. politics. People who would otherwise be Democrats vote Republican because they're against abortion, and identity is is playing that role at the moment on the left. So you have with Jacobin, for example, um, and other socialist parties, a, you know, a, a discussion around culture wars. We're all a little bit, I mean, the, the term woke, um, ironically enough, is becoming kind of tired. People are sort of tired of the word woke and of the idea of culture wars. I think that's good. I think that means that we're moving. Uh, so, some things have been kind of understood. Things that have been in play in the last three years have kind of been understood, at least on the DSA left, to a certain extent, where people are saying, look, we have enough of these culture wars. They're not advancing the left. They're, it, it, it plays to the concerns. It plays in a way to the game of the right. Neoliberals can, can do culture wars better than the left in some ways. And so, you know, technically speaking, we should leave it. We should let them have it, like let them have the culture war. Um, we know on the left, we're not sexist, racist, homophobic and xenophobic. We don't need to remind ourselves what we need to be doing is fighting corporate capitalism. What we need to be doing is fighting global capitalism. And the way you do that is not with anti-racism. The way you do that is with socialism. And socialism is anti-racist, anti-sexist, etc. Um, so, I mean, I didn't really answer your question as far as like uh, socially engaged art practice, but I'll, I will say this. Um, one of the concepts that has been discussed in the fine art series is moving away from art commodities towards something that wouldn't be um, 
you know, sort of um, easily, you know, commodi commodified, reified, presented by institutions like museums, auction houses, and so on. And I agree with that in general terms as a Marxist, of course. Um, but I would, I'm a little bit hesitant on the one hand to prescribe forms of cultural practice. Uh, in this, I agree with Greg Shillette that, you know, if someone makes paintings, it doesn't mean that they're not necessarily in some ways um, helpful to the left, not that it needs to be defined as helpful or um, instrumental. Uh, these are debates we could have, but I wouldn't rule out necessarily making objects, let's say, or video or film, you know, if you're an artist. And I would say too, that there is a, a danger that by moving away from commodities and moving more towards re relational experiences, um, and maybe in this distended way in social movement activism, um, that doesn't, it doesn't mean that you get rid of reification, right? So the idea is that if you take the object out from between two people, like you know, in this classic Marxist sense, objects speak. Um, if you take the object out and you just have relations, then suddenly, you know, and you have cooperation and you have a sharing economy, it's as though you're beyond capitalism. And I think that's a, a complete lure. Um, and we should be aware of uh, reification at the level of social relations, which is, as John mentioned, one of the reasons why I wrote Don't Network, because there's a heightening of technological determinism, even in social movement uh, thinking about uh, network, whether it's like literally at the level of technology or whether it's more amorphously at the level of, you know, how many people you can mobilize for an event. Um, Mark, so, we have a, Mark, we have another question. So um, just I'm going to um, invite just one, uh, one little thing, one little thing. And okay. so, yeah, so you move from commodity fetishism to the fetishization of particularity the fetishization of gender, race, identity. Um, and th this is one of the ways that I think that that lure has been swallowed by the left. Okay, thanks. So, um, Alexei, would you like to ask your question? Yes, if it, can you hear me well? Uh, because I, I got some impression that connection is not very good, but do you hear me? Yeah, uh, I can hear you, Alexi. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I, yes, as a reaction, because I know that Mark will improvise based on any question, will still carry on his current thinking. So, but I, I still want to ask you, I also wanted to say that thank, thank you for your paper, for many things, con uh, I mean, related to this, because uh, it also gives a kind of more uh, kind of overview of your current work because I, I was working recently with Mark because he contributed uh, with a chapter on Yellow West movement to a book on political philosophy I co-edited. So I can recognize from your what you are saying your recent interest in this sort of critique of uh, this particularism or uh, identity politics even uh, in this chapter because you talk there about this kind of. Uh, uh, critique of class essentialism, which comes from Chantal Mouffe and other kind of post-structuralist left, etc. So I can recognize broader scope of your work uh, in these kind of relations with uh, what you're saying today. So thanks for this in many ways. I was just uh, 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 reacting to what you're in. Also, I agree with many lines because philosophically, theoretically, I'm completely on your side on the side of universality, uh, let's say, uh, class universality or, or whatever kind of theoretical universality, political universality uh, against those sort of kind of uh, identity politics, which uh, uh, also linked to this recent, uh, you stressed this moralization of politics, uh, kind of this uh, uh, re retributive kind of justice, which somehow refunctions uh, re previously existing models of just thinking about justice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in general, I was just thinking uh, if, uh, how to say, because this debate about, we also had uh, actually with John and uh, PhD students, uh, we also had this seminar on decolonization in, running last 
uh, last uh, months, uh, this academic year. So we talked uh, through a few texts in the colonial theory, and we always somehow been returning to this question of universality versus uh, identity, because it's obviously linked to this decolonial discourse, decolonial critique, and also through your talk, I learned about this decolonial activism, which is uh, also in relation to art, which was extremely interesting because I didn't know about this moment strike thing, and it's quite very emblematic of many, for many things. So I was always thinking that, that this, uh, and we discussed this also in our seminars, that this debate about uh, particularly uh, this sort of uh, universalism, which runs already from the 90s among the leftists, Zizek, but you, uh, it was a book published, uh, debate on universe, uh, hegemony and universality between Zizek, but you and Butler, for example. So it was already maybe a few decades of these sort of issues are tackled by the left. And so maybe you already have a kind of archive or history of this debate, which could also be, I mean, not in terms of your work, but uh, I mean, in terms of your work as well, uh, in terms how how you could historicize this debate, how they emerged since, uh, let's say, 80s, and how they could be traced until today with mu much more intense political ramifications, right, of these uh, questions. So theoretically, I would say that this is a peak of this debate, so it's a little bit over uh, compared to what happened in the uh, 90s and later. Because and Alexei, also I was, Alexei, could you ask your question, please? Yes, because I was time. actually, my hypothesis, because in terms of this periodization of this debate about universalism, what actually, because uh, Badiou, for example, you mentioned Badiou democratic materialism and this kind of universalism that Badiou was proposing, uh, based on more kind of specific relations between event, universality, uh, it somehow comes also from uh, the crisis of 80s and the beginning of neoliberalism in the sense that by you, for example, in his early works in the 80s, he was always stressing that we cannot rely, uh, he openly, if you, read, uh, if you read his early work like short treatise on metapolitics or even earlier work in all the 80s, he is uh, basically saying that we cannot rely on universality of working class. So working class gets obscured, he uses his own kind of terminology. So, so but use attempt to rethink universalism somehow comes from recognition that uh, of some kind of the link between, uh, let's say, leftist intellectual or theorist or activism and uh, the class, universality of class is already obscured. So we cannot easily kind of reconnect with the class, let's say like this. And for him, this was obviously this post-68 thinking, which was not, uh, uh, was imagining some other formations of progressive let's say emancipatory class, not necessarily exactly white middle, white uh, European working class, but some other uh, fractions uh, which would be radical in society. So it's long-term problematics, which uh, goes even uh, uh, back uh, uh, to the 68 and, and, and so on. So I mean, the whole debate, I mean, theoretically is very complicated. So this is my first remark. Uh, and the second one, uh, second one I was thinking about because I also was somehow intrigued by your point that the colonial activists, they want to how to address these five centuries of, uh, of uh, this enormous amount of history and somehow resolve these five centuries in some specific small scale actions or cultural intervention, et cetera. So I agree with this. Uh, somehow disbalance or uh, lack of balance between this enormous history of colonization, exploitation, etc., and some cultural attempts to resolve or react uh, within the scope of few recent years. I think, but I think about this. I I, I was recalling this situation in uh, left-wing avant-garde, returning to art uh, of the 20s in so uh, in post-revolutionary Soviet Union, because the same kind of debate was there. How, what to do with five centuries of bourgeois art? given that now bourgeois class is somehow defeated in um, at least in the territory of Soviet Union, which was, uh, I mean, early history of art in Soviet Union before Stalinism, et cetera. So this was a similar question they were dealing with, uh, like what to do with five centuries of bourgeois art and the most radical position were uh, exactly like today's decolonial uh, activists, like we should get rid of all bourgeois art just to remove it Etc. So, for example, it was so-called prolet uh, proletarian culture activists. They, they thought. I'm sorry, Alexi, we are running art. out of time. Um, okay. Okay. So up. this was yeah. my two points of my comment: universalism and the situation, which is quite similar to all this sort of kind of radical negation of uh, 
kind of five centuries of uh, uh, the oppression or whatever. Yeah. Sorry, maybe it's not a question, it's just two comments. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for your questions. Um, you know, I mean, from a decolonial perspective, it depends if you ask, you know, what to do with 500 years of bourgeois art in a Soviet context, that's a different kind of question because it isn't specifically uh, 500 years, right? Like Marx talked about Greek art and that, okay. Okay. And, and, you know, humanist art, if you will. Um, so maybe the question for um, mm. Soviet, the Soviets was, you know, what do you do about humanism? Is, is humanism, like some ways the, the basis of bourgeois art and uh you know there are different solutions to that to that problem different answers given to that problems at different moments um but if you look at it from a decolonial perspective and you say you know what do we do with bourgeois art like if if all western art usually defined you know in relation to kant like Kant's the bad guy, uh, still today, um, and formalism, right? Greenbergian formalism. These are kind of like these are the these are the totemic figures, right? That in, in this kind of like Freudian totem and taboo, the, uh, the indefinitely in terms of talk symptom right, um, indefinitely, um, and oh, it says my connection, can you hear me? It says my connection is unstable, I'm okay. Um, but uh, from a decolonial perspective, if you say, you know, modern art, Western art is bourgeois or because it's Western, it's bourgeois, bourgeois is Western, the same difference. Um, you're using modernist terms, right? You're using, you're using modernist language to displace a concept. And one of, the, uh, one of the points I make in my essay about decolonial activism is the, the irony of people like Mignolo, for example, um, is that they're fully ensconced in Western thinking, yet they, they claim that they're speaking from outside of Western thinking. And in that way, I, I, refer, it, I refer to it as something like um, uh, Afrofuturism, right? Uh, you know, Sun Ra, and his orchestra spaces the place. Do you know the, the film by Sun Ra? He's a jazz musician. <clears throat> um, so any, anyhow, uh, the, it's about, uh, you know, Sun Ra has magical powers where he's going to get black musicians to um, leave planet earth and go off into space. And, um, there's some white people who try to help sort of like white Panthers, they, they try to help black Panthers, but they kind of don't get it because they're, they're part of the system. And in this whiteness studies way, there's nothing you can do in a, in a way if you're white, you're just in a, you're in a bad place. Um, there's, no, there's no solidarity beyond you know, more good intentions. So, uh, and the paradox of space is the place is that uh, space isn't simply outer space. It isn't simply somewhere else. It's something that's not defined. So in jazz, you can have breaks. Um, it seems that if you're playing a wind instrument, you're more likely to include space in your jazz music than if you're a guitarist, because you need to breathe. Um, and so it, it, it creates a kind of necessary, uh, or it, it necessitates a kind of music. And um, so space is a place, it's this kind of, you know, something that's non-discursive, that's, that's, that isn't represented. Um, and land back has a little bit of this kind of rhetoric, right, in this futurist sense, where if you don't get it, if you don't understand what we're saying, I mean, don't ask us questions, we're not going to explain it to you, right? Yeah. So you're either you're either with us or you're against us, but you can't be you, you can't be with us, you know, because you're not us. Um, so it's not quite Carl Schmidt, but you know it has. It, there there are histories where these kinds of concepts were used in more nefarious ways, right? Um, and so like this 
500 years of history in a, in a way I would say is, it's, a, it's like a ploy, right? Um, so, um, and with regard to your first question that had to do with Badiou's thoughts on whether or not the working in the uh, proletariat is not the class in itself, the proletariat is the class for itself. So, it, so the working class does not yet exist as a proletariat. I mean, except in the Soviet Union, where you know, at one point in the fifties, it was claimed that they had achieved communism. Um, so, um, you know, Badiou is alert to this kind of, uh, although you don't see it very much in his work, but a event is is not. Um, event is not something that's on the order of the situation, right? So uh, a different way that, th this is in my um, Bernie Bros Gone Woke, where I, I, I leave off from Nancy Fraser and I go into Zizek's work where he criticizes simulation. He says, the problem with postmodern simulation is that it's like, it's like the situation in Badiou, all the elements are there. Everything you need to know is there. It's all sort of like this new materialist immanentism. Um, and what it leaves out is the realm of appearance, which is the realm of something that has not happened yet. It's something that we don't yet, we have not yet achieved, but that we're capable of thinking about, we're capable of imagining. Um, so I could understand, you know, Badiou saying that the cultural revolution was really the last time that you had a uh, working class revolution and that everything afterwards was looking for an agent, looking for a new uh, subjectivity. With regard to the, the um, Multitudes book, um, one of the more, I mean, one of, the more, one of the more interesting ideas, but I find problematic ideas is that, you know, you can move or that we've moved from um, capital money, capital to capital, capital prime, right? That we, we, we no longer need the stage of commodification. <clears throat> so this kind of like, coincides with this new social movement desire to have you know, everything kind of decommodified without objects. Um, and that's kind of, it's a little bit ridiculous, right? Because we, I mean, it's a possibility, let's say, but uh, we still have to make a living. We still have to have money in order to live. We have contracts of some sort, even if we're giving um, educational services, right? So even if the product is immaterial or is a service of some sort, um, it still it still circulates in relation to um, capitalized institutions, realms, or nation states, and what have you. The one of the problems which increases the need for um, you know cultural services is the deindustrialization of Western um, nation states. So this Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to wind it up very, very soon. So we're, we're coming to an end. So if you want to um, uh, just uh, add a few final thoughts and then I'm going to uh, wind it up. Did you, Mark, did you hear that? Oh, do I have any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, do, yeah. Do, do you have any final thoughts? And then, and then I'm going to uh, wind up the, um, the session because we have to finish very soon. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have any final thoughts. Um, okay. I'll get back to you uh, on something, I'm sure. Yeah, well, thank, thanks enormously, um, you know, for a, um, uh, yeah, an ex excellent talk um, that I, I'm sure has been um, um, very, engaging and suggestive for uh, for all the uh, for all the ESRs on the program and uh, you know I hope that you can um, uh, maybe develop uh, some of these ideas in correspondence um, with us yeah absolutely so I mean so send send me an email uh, it's crickets over here you know and I don't even live in Cuba right okay Thanks then. So, um, uh, thanks everybody else for um, for uh, for listening and for the, all the questions that were asked. And um, see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Bye. -bye.